payments by and large have really been focused on consumer payments and on credit card payments. We're focused on bank transfers. The vast majority of the economy really moves over ACH, wire, even paper check in the US. That's about $750 trillion a year versus the credit card world's about $4 trillion a year. The companies that we've been partnering with are really thinking about how do you buy a house? How do you pay for healthcare? How do you pay for college? And those things you don't typically do over credit card, you do that over ACH, wire, and check. Hi everyone, it's Julie Verhage Greenberg here with your Tux Time podcast from FinTech Today, where we talk about all things FinTech. In this episode, I am joined by Dmitry Dadiomov, co-founder and CEO of Modern Treasury, who uh, before I started focusing more on like the B2B side of FinTech, I wasn't as familiar with them. But once I did, I realized that these guys are, they're doing pretty dang well in this side of the space. And it's an area that is booming. And uh, Dimitri, you guys recently closed a funding round, right? Yeah, thanks for having us here. Uh, we did just close our Series C. Awesome. Tell me a little bit about uh, this funding round and just like the funding environment in general um, this time around versus the last time that you guys raised. Because I think, you know, for, for any sort of company in fintech right now and other sectors too, for that matter, it's it's very different than what it might have been a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think if you take a step back, there's been this kind of turn in the capital markets that a lot more investors are uh, approaching innovation and creativity and tech in general. And so I think there's been a lot more um, money coming into the space. It's include, it includes both new investors and new types of companies that are being started and uh, it's certainly true for fintech, but I think it's true for you know electric cars and mRNA and AI and all sorts of kind of new new ideas. So I think we're going to look back at this time and um, see that there's a lot of just amazing uh, products and companies that have been built in this in this uh, period of time. But um, yeah, we we raised our Series C. It was led by Altimeter uh, and Benchmark. Uh, both have been uh, investors uh, of ours in the past, uh, and uh, we're very very excited to keep working with them. Since these were both investors that you'd worked with previously, like raising a new funding round, like what were some of the things that they were looking at going into it? And I, I assume that it's helpful in the fact that, you know, last times when you raised from them, you probably could do it in person, whereas this time I assume a lot of it might have been um, digitally done. Um, so I, I would assume that that like in-person interaction from previous made them more comfortable leading another round and things like that versus, you know, someone new coming in as well. Yeah, we're starting to come back sort of out of uh, a Zoom only world. So I think that's a, that's a welcome change for sure. Um, but, you know, I think at the end of the day, investors um, have a certain set of metrics and, and, and kind of performance that they'd like to see. In our case, a lot of what we think about is really usage from uh, uh, clients of ours, new clients we're signing up and, and kind of expansion of how much people are using our product and the, the North Star metric for us. Um, has always been reconciled volume. We did about $100 million a month a year ago, and uh, we're doing about $2.5 billion a month now. And so that's 25x uh, growth in a year. And um, that's something that, um, you know, as, as investors, I think, uh, you, you know, investors always want to see that uh, sort of growth. And so um, that's, that's at the end of the day, the, the thing that speaks for itself, I think, is, is um, the team, the, the, the numbers, the, the actual customer um, traction. Um, I think that whether it happens over Zoom or, or in person uh, doesn't doesn't change a whole lot. It certainly helps to be more familiar with investors personally. Um, that that I think for them makes it easier for them to make a bet on a company. But at the end of the day, I think it really comes down to the business. Yeah, for sure. So you mentioned a few of those numbers there. What else really caught investors' attention? Because you guys did raise at a much higher valuation this round than you did the previous round as well. And what's sort of driving that growth? Yeah, so if you look back to the beginning uh, of, of our sort of life as a company, we started out, we did Y Combinator in 2018. We started out partnering with Silicon Valley Bank as our first partner bank and really serving uh, a host of clients that are, um, uh, you've had some of them on the on the show, uh, but folks like Sign of Benefits and Side Real Estate and Check and, and folks like that, that uh, really are, you know, seed Series A, Series B companies at the time and, and um, are sort of the the ideal customer profile, if you will, for, for SVB. Um, as we've grown and we've added support for other banks, we've also started working with larger companies. And again, you've had uh, Robin Gandhi from Trip Actions on the show. 
um, and others uh, like you know Marketa, Augusto, etc. So really, what has been driving for us is the early stage startups that we started working with a couple of years ago have done you know phenomenally well, and we're super happy to kind of watch them grow and 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 power those types of businesses as well as kind of start to sign up larger companies. And that, uh, you know, combined is really what's driving our, our volume growth. Does competition look a lot tougher in this space now than what it did last time you raised? I think there's been a lot of uh, focus in this area to some degree, but payments by and large have really been focused on uh, consumer payments and on credit card payments. And if you look at the kind of um, area that we're focused on, it's much more focused on bank transfers. So uh, the vast majority of the economy really moves over ACH, wire, even paper check in the U.S. Uh, and starting to, we're starting to see real-time payments. Uh, that's about $750 trillion a year uh, versus, you know, the credit card world is about $4 trillion a year. So it's, you know, a couple of orders of magnitude difference, but it is very much the day-to-day life that we live as consumers is, is in credit cards. Uh, and the early um, uh types of companies on the internet have always been uh, things that you paid for with a credit card. So if you think about travel, um, you know, buying a book at Amazon, subscribing to Netflix, those types of experiences are uh, something you pay, you know, 20, 30, 100 bucks over a credit card on. And uh, more recently, the companies that we've been uh, partnering with are really thinking about how do you buy a house? How do you pay for healthcare? How do you pay for college? And those things you don't typically do um, over credit card. You do that over ACH wire and check. And so we get to um, work with those types of companies. And it's a, I think it's going to be a fast growing market as the internet sort of messes with these old school economy uh, parts of the economy. So as we get you know deeper into fintech here a little bit, I I have to ask if you think things like DeFi and crypto more broadly can bring about even more innovation in this space? Like, how are you at Modern Treasury thinking about any possibilities for using, you know, DeFi or crypto on your platform? Yeah, I think there's certainly a ton of innovation in that space. We uh, we really look at our customers' uh, day-to-day needs and try to solve those. And in some cases, we have customers in the crypto world, um, clients like BlockFi, that are uh, growing quickly and and, you know, they're not they're focused on the crypto side, but they also need to make sure that there is a fiat side that works for them as well. And so a lot of the deposits and withdrawals that people might be doing or funding loans, things like that, um, actually happen over uh, the old school payment rails of ACH or wire or check, uh, probably less of check, but certainly ACH and wire. Uh, and so in uh, the way I think uh, a lot of these innovations really start rolling out over time into the into the broader market really comes out of um, something like central uh, bank backed stable coins and things like that that make it much more uh, easily accessible for uh, large companies to start working with. We we ultimately you know serve larger clients that are doing kind of these B two C B two B type of transfers, and I think those um, you know I think crypto is starting to make inroads into that, but is but it's definitely early days there versus more uh, sort of consumer behavior. Who are sort of your sweet spot for customers too? And how has that evolved since you guys started? Yeah, I mean, we really try to build software for companies that move money. So when you think about what a payment operations platform does, it tries to you know, have the right uh, process and the right view for different roles inside of companies. When we think about a series A or B company, they may not have a fully built out finance team. They're more of a tech team trying to build a product. So um, the things that we have to think about is, you know, how does the engineering team interface with the bank? How does the engineering team um, or the product team maybe keep track of um, bugs and issues that might happen as they as they show up? And as the company grows, you have new teams that show up, that like customer service, and they have to answer questions from customers about the status of the payment. Um, there's there's a, you know obviously accounting and controller and and folks like that. They're really focused on closing the books and managing payments day to day, and so. We think a lot about how, you know, we talk about how good good fences make good neighbors. If the finance team trusts the engineering team to have access to the bank uh, accounts of the company, um, they have to be able to monitor it. They have to be able to um, hold things for approval sometimes or, or, or issue a refund or something along those lines. And so being able to build the right magic view for each user inside of a company is uh, what we think about a lot. 
Um, so to answer your question around, you know, what the company actually moves money for is relatively unimportant to us. What much more importantly is, you know, are they uh, are they building it out sort of as a core part of their product or service? And as a result, how many different teams have to interface and interact with the stream of payments and the flow of funds in general? All of this obviously involves a lot of bank relationships. How do you go about finding which banks that you want to partner with? We're very customer driven. So when we think about our customers, we believe custom, you know, our customers are going to pick the right bank for them. And they're going to potentially, as they grow international or bigger, might even work with multiple banks. And so we uh, always uh, sort of defer to our customers to make that decision. And then um, once we um, have a customer or two with a particular bank, we, we of course, start to build a, a relationship that's a little bit more direct. Um, but it always starts out with the customers. Got it. And recently you launched something called Ledgers. Tell me a little bit about this new product. Ledgers is a, is a fascinating product. Uh, one of the things that we've observed in the past year or so that we've been you know, powering a lot more clients that are more complicated in nature is that they have needs uh, internal to their own database, if you will, to their own application of managing things like wallets. Or you know, if you think about um, a lot of companies that manage uh, a, a flow of funds, they don't open a particular individual bank account per user. Like if you think about uh, maybe a Starbucks rewards card or something. I don't, you know, I don't have a uh, an account at some bank with twenty seven dollars for my Starbucks card. Um, they, there's some account that's probably an FBO or trust account or something, and it has, um, you know, maybe you know millions of dollars in it, and somewhere twenty seven dollars are credited to me. And so when I go buy a latte, that that gets decremented, and the you know Starbucks ledger gets incremented, if you will, for the three dollars that I just transferred. Um, and so we saw you know, 40, 50, 60% of our clients having to build some version of that internally. And sometimes it's an evergreen ledger that lives with you forever as a user. And sometimes it is much more of a a one-time ledger, if you will. So think of like a title and escrow use case where you're buying or selling a house. And um, we built, decided to build that as a product. It's kind of a standalone product. And it allows people to not have to worry about uh, building that from scratch, not making mistakes can be very, very expensive if you mess up sort of the ledger. And so we provide kind of flawless tracking for that. We provide ways for people to start up uh, different, you know, spin up different ledgers for whatever use case you have. And interestingly enough, it doesn't even have to be um, uh, currency. Like we've had, you know, gaming and so on, uh, use cases that popped up where you have to keep track of, you know, uh, gold and wood and stone and sheep, but it's still a ledger uh, inside of a game. So there's a, some really interesting use cases for that. And uh, we're investing behind ledgers in a big way. So with connecting with banks and powering all these new products and everything, is this is it getting easier or harder to do just given that I feel like everybody's paying so much more attention to fintech and realizing how important it is, but all of these legacy systems that you have to deal with on a daily basis, I mean, they're not, you know, they're still there. There's still a lot of filing cabinets that have paperwork in them and everything. So how do you sort of combat this? And is, is that job easier or harder today than it might have been a year or two ago? Well, I think that is the value prop of our company in some ways is to help people not have to think about that. So um, I think I'd like to think that for developers building new companies, it's easier because they can pick up modern treasury and run with it. Um, you know, on our end, uh, some things are getting easier because we have a lot more expertise and experience uh, integrating with certain types of systems. We just have a lot of the tooling around it. Um, some things are, you know, also uh, become challenging when you start operating in much, much higher scale and, and higher degrees of complexity. So, um uh, but ultimately, I think that this is all sort of good for the innovation economy. It's just easier to get started with cool new products. And um, when you, there's more infrastructure to pick up and run with, that's all uh, we all sort of win. Switching to a more personal level here too now, what do you think are some of like the biggest misconceptions that people have about being a founder? Because I think a lot of people that have not experienced it think of it as one way and then it, it like it's it's very different than what a lot of people kind of imagine the founder life actually is. So, I mean, just like to anyone listening to this that does have this dream of being a founder at some point, which a lot of our listeners do, what do you think is some of the misconceptions that, you know, is it important that they know 
going into that process? I think being a founder is uh, both easier and harder than people people talk about it. I mean, I think that in some ways, when you think about starting a company, there's a long, long, never-ending list of things that you have to do, and you just have to go do them, and you probably are not very good at any of them, um, but you're going to have to go figure that out. Um, at the same time, I think it's harder because at a sort of psychological or, or mental space level, you just have to stick with it for a very long time. And uh, it's never, even in the cases that look like they've been sort of these overnight successes, you know, the, the quote goes that, it, you know, it's a 10 year overnight success sort of thing. But I think in a lot of cases, these companies uh, on a day to day basis, you just have to stick with something for uh, for a long time. And so um, I think for us, for example, when we were in Y Combinator, we were focused on building this um, pretty, you know, pretty robust, pretty heavy, pretty large infrastructure product. And, uh, you know, that's it's hard to make visible progress week over week when you do that. So when we would meet with our kind of Y Combinator group and a lot of companies had some sort of graph that grew two, three, four, ten 10 percent, you know, week over week. Um, we didn't have a graph. We were very consistently at zero percent growth because we we're just building. And I think that that's um, you have to sort of have this, you know, I don't know if it's conviction, if it's stubbornness, whatever, whatever you want to call it. But you have to have it as a founder because uh, you're going to have to go through long phases of like zero visible progress. And the progress that's there is really only, uh, you know, kind of internal or like you, you feel like, hey, we wrote a lot more code. Hey, we, we convinced a, a company to give it a shot. Um, and I think that it's that's that's the part that I think is harder. Like the, the, the part that's easy is just a million to do list things like anybody can do them. Um, but the harder part is really how do you stick with it and uh, do it despite very little progress and kind of affirmation from the outside world. Now that you are having progress, you know, what does the future of modern treasury and this, your space as a whole look like? Yeah, I think we um, I touched on this earlier. I think that we're seeing just this flowering of companies that are uh, really innovating in sectors of the economy that didn't see a lot of web innovation. And uh, that is specifically um, things like real estate, like financial services, like healthcare, like education. Um you know, I'd argue there are things that we really care about a lot as a society. It's a good thing to see innovation in them. We we focus on the kind of payment and money movement side of it, which, um, you know, is somewhat tangential to the actual innovation they're trying to bring. But a lot of the inefficiencies in those markets um, are going to be a really good thing for, for us as a society to to fix. Um, so for Modern Treasury, I mean, we, we want to continue building the best payment operation software there is. Uh, we're going to, you know, uh, partner with more of the leading banks and um, over time, probably, you know, become more international and uh, serve more sort of roles inside of companies. But at the end of the day, we, we just want to make it easier for people to start companies that um, or, or build new products inside of existing companies that really change how these sectors of the economy are run. So if someone wants to find out more about you or your company, whether it be for a job or perhaps using you guys for something that they're building, how do they get in contact with you? Check out our website, monotreasury.com. Uh, we're, we're hiring and growing, so monotreasury.com slash careers. Um, I'm, on, I'm on Twitter. You can follow me at, at Dadiomov, D-A-D-I-O-M-O-V. And um, yeah, we'd love to get in touch. We'll have to have you back on again uh, when, you know, the space is changing by the month. So I, I'm sure in the near future, we'll have even more to talk about. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And if anyone wants to find out more about fintech more broadly and stay up to date, go to fintechtoday.co. That is our website. Otherwise, I will catch you guys again next time.